Uh, well, welcome from uh, Bath for Europe. This is another one of our um, Zoom speaker events, which we've become so famous for over the past couple of years now, sadly. Um, today, we welcome Mike Ballsworthy. So uh, Dr. Mike Ballsworthy is the co-director of the Bylines Network. He's also the founder of Scientists for EU and a campaign strategy advisor at the European Movement. You may recognize him from many of his videos during the um, anti-Brexit campaign, and he's obviously been an, an incredibly vocal opponent to Brexit, particularly uh, when it comes to its impact on the sciences, as that's clearly his background. Um, so this evening, he's going to talk to us about um, the impact that Brexit is having on science in the UK. And um, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat and um, we will uh, go through them uh, after that. So, Mike, over to you. Okay. Uh, hi, all. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, what the, the plan is here is that I'll talk for about 20 minutes to give you the overview of what's going on at the moment, what the damage already done is, and then it's pretty much at that point open to questions so that we can just chat about not just the science issue, um, any questions that you've got that relate to all of this or any discussion points that spin off this, um, including uh, where do we go now? What's happening with Boris Johnson? What is the European movement planning to do? What am I planning to do? Any of these kind of questions are legit. So. Uh, without further ado, let's launch into the science, because this is um, after quite a long time of it not being an issue, is now building up to be a real issue again. And you may have noticed that our participation on the new European science programme called Horizon Europe, that started in 2021 and is meant to run for seven years, um, is now being held hostage, if you were, or our participation on it is being held hostage by the standoff over the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I will go into why that is uh, in a bit. Um, what are the reasons that the EU gives for separating this out um, and using it in the way it is as, as leverage but also refusing to let us in. What happens next with that? Um, but before all of that, let's, let's have a recap of where British science is with the whole Brexit deal. Now, when I started Scientists for EU back in May 2015, um, we didn't know within the science community how many people were pro-EU and how many people were pro-Brexit. We, we had no idea. It was a it wasn't really a topic that had been brought up much. But when we launched Scientists for EU, it quickly became clear that the figure was around about 90% um, that were pro-EU. And uh, the reason being that even though we'd had some gripes before with some previous incarnations of the EU science programme, which had been going on since the 1980s, by the year 2015, we had been starved out in our country for the last um, decade or so, sort of flatlining on investment, whereas the EU investment was absolutely ramping up. And further, it was doing things that we just couldn't do on a national level, uh, namely putting out big grants that all these different countries were pitching into, uh, meaning that we could put together any pick and mix combinations of different uh, universities and, and businesses, but it was mainly universities at the time, uh, combinations and constellations that we liked in order to achieve some really global level projects. Also, there was a lot of funding for um, individual fellowships, generous funding, including for people to be moving between countries as well. So it really put the UK that did very well on this program at, the heart of a European hub and made Europe uh, the leading competitor against the US and the China and China for science, for, for the volume of output, for, for quality, for number of researchers, all of these kind of aspects. Europe was, was looking dominant because of this new cohesion that the science programs had brought in. 
Well, anyway, um, although we tried during the referendum to, to represent that voice, uh, we did lose it. And on losing it, you saw immediate impact from Brexit, the, the very day of the vote, actually. Um, this is something that I had planned as the vote day was coming up. If we won it, that I had one plan in uh, my left hand pocket. And if we lost it, I had another plan in my right hand pocket. And I had to go for the, for the more grim plan, which started off with mapping the damage. So the initial impact of Brexit, uh, we saw a lot of reports of hiring freezes. We saw people who'd been offered jobs in the, UK, in the UK turning them down. We saw the plummeting value of the pound mean that a lot of people had blown their budgets because they had budgeted to buy equipment from elsewhere in the world. Uh, we saw uh, hiring uh, uh, freezes. We saw rejections um, of, of offers that had been made. We saw uncertainty interfere with a lot of the collaborative relationships that had been um, set up. Um, so there was, there was quite a lot of damage across the board and a lot of anger as well. A lot of European scientists in the UK had also, during uh, the build-up to the referendum, encountered uh, xenophobia that they hadn't seen in previous years as well not in the universities themselves or the campuses or the workplaces, but rather out in the local towns. So one of the things that the government tried to do at the time was to reassure um, our science population that nothing was going to change in terms of our science relationship. Everyone knew that this was a win-win for the UK and the EU. And so promise was made very early on by Theresa May, despite uh, hardcore rhetoric and lots of other places that the that science relationship would be preserved. All well and all good, apart from the fact that as the Brexit negotiations went on, there were at various time points threats that maybe a deal wouldn't come off, maybe there would be no deal Brexit. In fact, no deal was better than a bad deal. So it was really on the table. And if there were to be no deal, then that would suddenly mean um, an abrupt break to all of the little funding rivers that were coming out of the EU into the UK. If we stopped paying in to the EU, then we didn't have any contract anymore on the science programme. And that meant that we would be ineligible for almost half of the lines of grant that we were currently benefiting from by my calculation, which was um, uh, somewhere between half a billion and a billion a year. I, I, I can't, um, somewhere in that range to, to the best of my uh, recollection. So this, this threat hung there uh, all the way from late 2016, all the way through to the end of 2020, when that funding program ended, Horizon 2020. And after it ended, I was able to do some analysis of what impact that had actually caused. And what I found was that we had dropped from joint first place with Germany on the program in terms of funds won and participations won. We used to be joint first with Germany going back all the way through the previous science program. It just been going on for years, you know, UK ahead, Germany ahead, Germany ahead, UK ahead, like that. After 2016, we fell down behind Germany, then France, then Spain, then Italy, into fifth place, just above the Netherlands. And this is this is for money one and the Netherlands is a small country and we were only just above it for <laughs> funds one and that added up to 1.5 billion pounds short of uh, where of what Germany had won during that same time period so that was 1.5 billion lost even though we were fully on the program and fully paying into it just the uncertainty of Brexit to UK science put us in onto fifth rung. 
So that was the position that was then our new starting position for when Horizon Europe was going to start at the beginning of 2021. So let's, let's park that up and talk about the other things that happened during that time. Firstly, uh, we lost our um, European Medicines Agency. That had been sitting in London with a turnover, a taxable turnover of over 300 million pounds. Um, we had 900 staff there, but more importantly, this institute, the European Medicines Agency, attracted a lot of pharma businesses into those locations around it in Canary Wharf, London, and had about 40,000 business visits per annum. So did a lot to fuel a lot of the local hotels, restaurants, travel, you name it. So we had that hub. And by dint of just coming out of the EU, we no longer had rights to that. So that European Medicines Agency went off to Amsterdam, taking those jobs, that, that, that skill, and that's money and all of that business activity with it. And it left behind our um, medical um, health and regulations um, agency, our MHRA, that had previously been working with the EMA as a sort of twin machine covering all of the single market for medicines of Europe, which is the second largest in the world behind America. Even though we've got a larger population, America just uses more drugs. Um, but we had been uh, running that market saying yes or no to the different drugs and medical devices coming through. And our MHRA um, and our EMA basically had been doing that together. So the EMA goes away, it's our MHRA, which then, if you recall, in, the, in the, um, the vaccine approvals, was first off the mark with vaccine approvals, even though this was under EU law, they are good. They are a great team. But their business has dropped because we are now no longer in the single market for medicines. And it was threatened last summer that it could lose up to 25% of its staff now. Uh, that's something that Boris Johnson didn't brag about, just because we are now our own small market behind the EU, behind the US, behind Japan. We're down in about fifth place. So we're low priority or lower priority, much lower priority for a lot of the innovative medicines coming to market that people want to put in the big markets first. So we have really lost um, a lot of edge there and, and with it some representation from pharma companies that, that are used that were otherwise set up in the UK. They had to build other structures in the European uh, single market and spend a lot of money on them to hold it there. We also um, had problems with uh, Galileo, as you may well know, which is the uh, European version of America's GPS system or the Russian GLONASS. It's um, a global navigation system. And we had put a lot of time and money and investment into it. Uh, but now, by dint of Brexit, because we are outside the EU, this um, Galileo system serves the security interests of EU nations exclusively, which meant that suddenly some of our top cutting edge businesses um, in the satellites area can no longer compete for those security grants or be privy to some of that sensitive information. And because um, we found this unacceptable in our country, well, we, it is unacceptable that our military, for example, could not have that fine detail that, that Galileo was bringing forth. We had to spend oodles of money trying to build our own system or, or buy out one web to try and adapt it. And that became a farce in itself. Um, and so you're looking at loss after loss. We, we, the, with the regional development funds, which were largely focused on science and, and innovation, by the end of it, we've lost that. And we've been placed, the government is replaced with a fraction of that money in terms of our place in Euratom. Um, that is also now um, under threat with our uh, Northern Ireland protocol shenanigans. And we are only um, part of ITER, the big international nuclear fusion site in France, 
through our relationship with Eurotom, which was a, a little um, hook that we had rather than being a part of it as an independent country. We saw our students from the EU drop by about 41% at about the same time. This was reported around about the same time that our government decided to cut us out of Erasmus, which was bringing tens of thousands of students to our shores. And I will remind you that our higher education is one of our greatest exports. It is an export, and it's an export that happens on our soil. People drink in from around the world, uh, future leaders uh, of, of businesses or of nations often have spent time in the British higher education system. That is a, a soft power that we have in an export that happens on our soil because people come here to also live and spend money here while they're getting that education. So we've put up barriers to all of those. Um, and the supposed benefits that we were meant to get from uh, Brexit in terms of freer regulation, well, the government set up a task force in order to look into the opportunities there. And one of the two chairs of that, George Freeman, um, helped steer it to a conclusion that actually we don't want to deregulate here. We just want to think about how more agile we might be in the future with our freedom, <laughs> fully acknowledging that there were no standards that the EU had set that we wanted to rip up uh, within science and innovation and medicine and health. So um, it left us with um, also some businesses like Intel and Tesla saying that they wouldn't set up in the UK because of Brexit. So right the way from industry to talent coming in, into our higher educations, into um, our, our participation on the science programme, into our industry leadership in the pharmaceutical sector, all of those um, took big hits. But the biggest uh, damage to date is what we're looking at right now, which is the fact that even though in the, um, the TCA, uh, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement with the EU, we added on that we would be full participants of the new EU science program, Horizon Europe, starting the year 2021. That has not been fully signed off yet. It's there in principle in agreement, but we haven't got the actual sign off yet to go and release the money. The reason being the Northern Ireland Protocol. So the EU is refusing to sign us fully into that program while the Northern Ireland Protocol remains unresolved. Now, that means that since the start of 2021, the vast majority of grants we've just missed out on. Um, there's, there's streams that we've been able to participate in as, as sort of like second fiddle and our government's been able to cover it, but because we're not fully part of it, then that means that if we don't get accepted as a full associate member, we step down to third country status where we're only eligible for about half of the funds that otherwise we could get. Some of the big fellowships we can't do, but most importantly, it is the coordination of those multinational collaborations that we can no longer engage in. We can't head them up. We can come on as a secondary partner taking instructions from others, but the actual leadership role where we were so dominant before, we don't, we don't have that. And the commission is currently telling uh, projects that are approved where the UK is a lead uh, to restructure it so that another country leads. Um, and that is to protect those projects. Similarly with fellowships that are due to be based in the UK, those would be illegitimate if we were a third country rather than having signed up to the programme. So the Commission announced about a month ago to um, a few dozen of those that had won uh, fellowships to go to the UK or to, to run in the UK, you have to change those to another EU member state or associated country because there's a high risk that they could become illegitimate in the near future. And not a lot of people can swap those over. But you start to get a sense of the damage done. You know, we started 
this new program in fifth place rather than first place. And now we are being told that we have to step down from either individual fellowships based in the UK and move them or step down from leadership roles in, in these big programs. It's, it's absolutely devastating. Now, why, you might ask, is, is the EU doing this? Surely the UK and the EU together benefit from the science program. Um, even Canada is signing up now. So surely the UK can, they know our science community, we're good for it, it's beneficial. This should be entirely independent, right? Well, there's, there's three things going on here. Firstly, there is the fact that we only signed the TCA because we had a withdrawal agreement that went before it. That was the 2019 um, oven ready deal that was the withdrawal agreement with the Northern Ireland Protocol that said that we're settling up all our financial differences, paying that 39 billion, uh, covering um, who gets what assets and covering pensions and also coming to an arrangement that if a future trade agreement falls through, nevertheless, we're all even Stevens now in terms of guaranteeing our interests going forward. And the Northern Ireland Protocol was part of that fundamental guarantee. So then the EU are now saying, if the whole TCA rested on the withdrawal agreement, and you pull the plug on the withdrawal agreement, well, that is all foundational to the big trade agreement we did, and, and science is part of it. So how can we go forward with a lot of those arrangements when the very foundations of them that we set in 2019, you're pulling the plug on unilaterally against our will? The second argument associated with that is one of... Um, the EU not being mugs and ensuring that contracts with them are honoured. So how can the EU, they think, in reasonably go and say, yeah, it's okay, UK, we'll sign a new contract with you, even though you're in the middle of blowing up a previous contract that we've signed with you? Like, how can we go and do that? That, that would be nuts on our part, um, either to, yeah. Uh, and then associated with that is, is the real politic that the EU faces, which is if it has to face down, whether it be uh, Putin or China or even within their own ranks, Hungary, they cannot look like they're, they're, they're an easy you know, pushover in terms of uh, the rules that they set, because then everyone will have a go. So they've, they've got to look um, as if they hold their word on this and they've had success previously with if you will getting their way when someone is dishonoring contracts they've signed with them before back in 2014 uh, the swiss had a referendum on whether they should ditch free movement one of their agreements with the single market and they agreed narrowly by 0.5 percent yeah yeah we'll ditch it um and then croatia joined the EU immediately after that and everyone that signs up to free movement had to sign yeah Croatia is now on board and they have the same rights as other people with free movement to come to our country Switzerland wouldn't sign that they said citing their own referendum they just can't sign it and the EU said well you're breaking all of your contracts with us because that goes against the deal that we have and so the EU withheld uh, the the joining of the Swiss onto their new program. They said, basically, if you don't sign this contract, then we can't sign this one with you about the science program. And it absolutely screwed up uh, Swiss science for four years until the Swiss internally sorted out what the hell they were doing with free movement. They actually had another referendum on it and uh, the population woke up a bit more and, and took this one more seriously than they had previously. And then that was all fixed and the Swiss were back in the program. So. The EU does have form as using um, the science programme as a bit of a football, but also as a point of principle about contracts. So 
that's where they are at the moment. And I, I realize I've gone over 20 minutes to 25 now, so I'll wrap this up quickly. But uh, the long and short of it is that we're really, really stuck now. It was thought that we may be able to resolve the Northern Ireland protocol situation at the end of last year, the end of 2021. And then there wouldn't have been much damage done to science um, if, if the UK you know, agrees the recommendations the EU had, fine, we're back in, no one's really noticed any difference. But now that we're getting into 2022, it's really getting um, really threadbare, thin now, patients on both sides. If the UK blows up the Northern Ireland Protocol, we are out. But if the UK um, strings it along anymore, then even within the UK, people are thinking, we've missed out on so much now, maybe we need to make our own programme. And that's, they're, they're calling it plan B, but they're now thinking, crikey, we're gonna have to do this. And so these are the pressures on at the moment, essentially, unless the UK government folds and says, you know what, your adaptations to the Northern Ireland Protocol within the rules of the Northern, Pro to Northern Ireland Protocol, we can live with those. Unless that happens, we are going to see wreckage on the EU science programme, our participation in it, and it is going to hurt UK science hugely, um, but not so much EU science, which ironically is already starting to benefit from something of a uh, brain drain uh, from the UK already. So the damage won't be mutual. A lot of people like to say that it will hurt both parties, but actually the EU is, is, is big, it's got its framework set up, it'll just be treading water on it, some losses, some advantages, uh, but the UK will be badly, badly hurt in terms of being an attractive place for, for multinational science and talent. And I will wrap that up there um, and say, ask me anything and pass back to Emma to, to coordinate the discussion. Brilliant. Thank you, Mike. That was uh, really interesting. We have had quite a lot of questions. Just a reminder, if you do have a question for Mike, just pop it in the chat. And if you could put the word question at the beginning, that would be really helpful. Um, so starting up, there's a couple of questions which I think you have touched on, but it might be interesting to, to talk a bit more in detail. So firstly, from Fiona, what has the impact been of European students not or no longer attending UK universities? Do we have any detail on that? And secondly, from Ulrika, what does Brexit ultimately mean for medicine? Are there any major collaborations that are going on at all? Right, so um, on the universities one, um, EU students that came to UK universities were one and a half times more likely to get a first class degree than our own native students. Which, which shouldn't surprise you, it's not, um, it's not a genetic thing. It's the fact that those students that are more active and, and mobile and adventurous um, tend to be the, the brighter ones. But it goes to the wider point of when we had our doors open to the rest of our continent, especially having the world-class universities that we do, plus English language, we really did attract the, the best and the brightest, which goes to really enrich our own educational environment. Um, it is like with the Erasmus programme, not everyone has, has the opportunities in life to go and uh, study and, and live abroad, and a lot of our students won't, but for those that are in our universities, um, to have students come from, um, so many different places and mingle with them and make friendships and make links has been enriching for our students in situ here, you know, global universities here in our, in our neighborhoods. So um, the damage um, done is very much a cultural one, which is why Nicola Sturgeon was absolutely right to call uh, the, the ditching of um, the Erasmus pr program cultural vandalism. Um, economically, of course, you lose out when um, students, um, you know, dry up. From my understanding, the, the drop in students from Europe is to a degree counterbalanced by increase in students from elsewhere around the world. But, um, but we shouldn't be treading water on that front. I mean, we, we should have been getting 
all the European students that we had coming, plus the natural growth um, from other countries around the world that is still developing, like China and like India uh, and like elsewhere in uh, Asia or that that uh, or South America that can uh, send students in. We should have been growing, not treading water, because we've got a hefty loss offset by you know natural growth from elsewhere in the world. So um, it's hard to put um, figures on it. Like I alluded to before, there's there's a big economic benefit, not just of you know fees that that people come and pay when they come here, but actually by living here. Um, there's been some great analyses done in previous years by Universities UK of what a vibrant university attracting international students um, and international researchers does for local economies. Um, so um, I don't have any quantitative data to hand on what, you know, that economic loss has been, but um, yeah, I can certainly paint you that picture of um, of what it does mean and what the cultural loss is. Uh, and there was another part of it too, which, which was about the yeah, medicine, medicine right? collaborations. Are there any major collaborations still happening in, in medicine? Yes, but there are big risks here, um, as um, I was just finding out from um, talking to um, a colleague, which is, UK has often been a great leader for a lot of medical innovation across uh, the continent. Um, we, we've traditionally had a very, very strong role in, in life sciences and that particular part of it. The risk now is that without that common funding of the horizon pot, with our ability to lead on those projects without us being involved in the single market for medicines and conforming to the same standards for medical devices and with the threats that maybe we're going to diverge from the rest of Europe um, on uh, drug testing standards or data adequacy or even uh, shipping of uh, biological materials or DNA or things like that it is a risk to have the UK as a partner because we might not be playing by the same regulations going forward. So even though um, you know we still we still have a lot of networks and connections across Europe, it's really really taken the the shine off and put the spooks into. Um, UK partners being a leading force on pan-European uh, work. Um, there is actually a question about that. Oh, so another thing I'll say, sorry, sorry, just before I don't forget, and also remember that, that with, with the EU science programme, it is actually global. You can participate from anywhere in the world on that, you know, second fiddle level, and the UK has often led, particularly in health science, a lot of projects that then go and span uh, Asia, Africa, South America, and what have you. But additionally to that, remember when the um, overseas development budget was, was cut back by this government? Well, that cut a whole load of UK science, particularly health collaborations that we had ongoing around the world. Those contracts were just cut in the middle and ended. And so that did major damage to our reputation as, as, a, as a stable partner for health research around the world. One of those projects that got cut halfway through, this was this was in, I think it was 2020 or 2021, in the middle of COVID, was actually one tracing variants in uh, South America, COVID variants in South America. And it got cut right in the middle, <laughs> right when that's what, so yes, so it was, it was nuts. So the, the whole Brexit mentality, not just in our destruction with Europe, but the investment of our collaboration with other science actors and health actors around the world got that double hit as well. And it, that's really embarrassing. Mm, no, absolutely. Um, you were talking just a minute ago about this uh, possible removal of precautionary principles and, and restrictions, which some 
Brexit ministers have identified as a benefit of Brexit. So you yeah. mentioned it as a risk. Uh, mm. Are there any benefits of that at all? Um, in theory, yes. In practice, it's really hard to find them. Um, so in theory, um, if the UK can have lighter regulations in an area of, of um, uh, medical science, for example, where there would be uh, slower approval or more resistance elsewhere in Europe. Um, take, for example, stem cells and uh, Catholic opposition that you may get to stem cell research uh, coming from, you know, Poland um, or, or elsewhere then um, in theory the UK can make strides um, ahead of other countries by having you know freedom in those regulations and, and we and we get ahead thusly. Um, in the real world however it doesn't tend to pan out that way um, it's not the case that you know um, North Korea and, and other places where you or, or, or Russia where you've got very very little regulation get ahead of um, the UK Europe uh, the states in in these kind of areas um, it's the case that where there is excellent science um, those area those um, countries tend to lead and they tend to be the first ones to effectively make cases to lawmakers about what else they need and, and articulate that well. So there's, there's theory and practice. You know, the other one, of course, is, is GMOs. And, you know, there's claims about golden rice and things like that. And if only we could do these kind of experiments. Well, golden rice was designed in, in, in Germany, you know, in the EU. The, the restrictions about, you know, where you can sell it and use it and plant it predominantly. And um, same with other GMOs. And so if we were to develop GMO plants, we wouldn't be able to sell that into the, to the European market. We'd have to open up sort of new markets where they do accept that. And um, it just get a, it gets a lot more complex uh, than, than you would think. So the, the whole regulations thing, in, in theory, you can permit things to happen in UK labs before they're allowed elsewhere in the EU. But firstly, you've got your own national audience um, that you have to make the case to. And sometimes it may be them that provides all the objections to advancement of science before the public is, is fully on board and you have to respect that. Um, and other times, it's just a case that um, there isn't so much of a, of a first mover advantage there. It's, it's more about where the quality research structures and then big investments come, actually. So it's more about the, the scientific infrastructure that you've got as a whole. Um, we mentioned Erasmus um, several times earlier. Um, what are your thoughts on the uh, Turing scheme, which is obviously the British equivalent um, to Erasmus? Um, right. I haven't seen a, a lot of full and complete data on it yet to compare with Erasmus. I, I will give the government credit for one thing, and that's that they got it up and running really fast. I didn't think that they were actually going to be able to get a program in place in the time that they did. Um, I think the, the main take home message though is the Turing scheme is all about sending our people elsewhere for them to get experiences and come back. Um, what you had with uh, the Erasmus scheme um, was a much, much broader community where there were exchanges both ways. And so there are a lot more links built because we also took in um, people from right across Europe and further afield 
you know, into our universities and also in, into other projects and other workplaces. Um, and so that, that two-way flow is really the thing that is, that is sorely uh, missing um, and, and lost. As well as, um, and this was very cynical of the government, um, the reason why we believe the government really rejected um, Erasmus, even after promising that they'd go with it, was that the price tag on Erasmus uh, sort of increased quite substantially um, round about, you know, the end of 2020. You know, the, the, the budget for the next plan increased a lot. And it was largely to expand the program, uh, particularly to include uh, provisions for lots of disadvantaged people, whether it be disabilities or whether it be disadvantaged backgrounds, um, and include, you know, new sectors of, you know, the educational structure um, that people thought needed to be served. So that put a bigger price tag on it. And apparently Rishi Sunak balked at that and thought, we're not paying that kind of money. And besides, why should we be paying uh, for them to be coming over here? Um, I don't know why he, I, and I think there, there's there's some some cultural vandalism aspect to that. Um, but he decided that it would be better if our students we gave them more opportunities of where they could go around the world, and that's the main focus of it. So that's what we should do. Um, and so then. That's what they did. They decided not to be part of it. They decided they'd make their own, you know, proper sort of British thing. And one of the first reasons they gave was that Erasmus was very middle class. And they all came out with this line early on that Erasmus had been a middle class. Well, firstly, um, it was designed to be fully broad spectrum to give opportunities to youth everywhere. And it was our government's responsibility to make sure that all of our kids had the opportunities to take advantage of it. Secondly, it was deeply cynical because the reason why Erasmus had just increased in cost was exactly because it had been expanded. So it was, it was um, really frustrating to see that, that, that disingenuous argumentation. Uh, that was very, very culture warsy as well. So yeah, that's that's what I think about that. Um, I'm I'm not going to slag off um, Turing just just for the sake that it was the government's invention to replace Erasmus. I want to see what what the data are on that after the first years. I think it's good to open up channels to elsewhere in the world, but I just think it should be con complementary to the system that. So many people have, have grown to love. It, it's matured well. Um, all of our universities and, and those structures were supporting it. So why the hell would, would you cut it off other than uh, making a purely political decision that is based on personal preferences of a, a few people in the executive rather than what the actual community of the country for whom it is relevant wanted? So I thought that was a piece of, of real selfishness and irresponsibility. Good. Thanks, Mike. A um, bit more generally, so I'm going to put two questions together. Uh, one, can the next non-conservative chancellor afford not to rejoin the EU? Um, and um, what can scientists do, improve, do uh, specifically to improve our chances of sort of moving closer towards uh, and eventually rejoining the EU. Right. Um, so there, the, there are a few large problems with rejoining the EU, which we need to tackle in order to get there. Um, so it's not just down to a chancellor's say so that this would be in our economic interest there the thing is done um, one of them is that in order for us to rejoin the eu the eu have to want us back and one of the things that they will be very wary about is if they have one major political party 
let's call them the conservatives, that are absolutely ardently against rejoining, and another political party, let's call it Labour, that are absolutely for it, this is wishful thinking at the moment, um, then that is not good enough for the EU to say, yeah, yeah, now that we've got a Labour government, come in, because the way they will see it is like, well, this is going to be playing the hokey cokey down the down the decades, isn't it? You know, you're in, then you're out, then you're in, then you're out and shake it all about. And like we're dealing with you all the time and it, with your inniness and outiness. So regardless of what any chancellor wants from the EU's perspective, they need to see a country where all major parties are predominantly run by people who want a closer relationship with Europe and have um, disowned Brexit, essentially. So that is a really hard nut to crack. And that is why it's so important that we're actually not anti-Tory at the moment. We, 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 can, be, we can be passionately anti-Johnson and we can and we should pin it all on Johnson and Johnson's project with his little cabal and Johnson should be removed from the Conservatives so that the Conservatives can reinvent themselves. This is where we need to go, and we need to actually nurture those within the Conservative Party who are actually pro-European Conservatives, um, both of older generations and, um, and younger, particularly the younger. Um, so that's one hurdle. And then the other is, of course, the terms of us going back in. And then the other is, of course, you know, enough people in the population that, that make it essentially a, a super majority. So there's a lot of work to be done for a full rejoin of the EU. But moving on to the second question, uh, which is about what scientists can do. I mean, for me, science is the best example of where the EU really, really works, where collaboration works, where a common pot of investment works, and that common pot of investment works alongside a set of regulations uh, and rules that are all the same, which means all of our data is good everywhere, all of our travel is good everywhere, all of our shipping standards are good everywhere, and uh, the University of, of, of Leuven and the University of Sheffield can just work together as if they were in the same country. Um, and that has given us fantastic powers that a lot of people didn't actually, um, especially when the referendum kicked off, they thought European science and um, was far behind where, where American science is, and it, 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 it isn't. Um, you know, Europe, Europe is a powerhouse, and, you know, Britain was doing very, very well from that powerhouse sitting on top of it. So I think um, you've got in, in science your beautiful example where the team um, is so much more than the sum of its parts. People understand that logically and, and viscerally how that how that makes sense. Um, you can see the scale of that. You can see the opportunity in that, and the excitement in that, and the future direction in that. So I think science can really be a beacon of that collaborative opportunity, not just on Europe, but then for the world. And this is why I've always been a supporter of the EU, because the way I think about things is, what's the, what's the strategy for humanity? Here we are sitting on a little moat of dust, going round a grain of sand, of which there are more of these grains of sand in the universe than all the grains of sand on the earth combined. It's a vast world out there. We've identified ourselves as one species, we know all the countries now. We've, we've mapped our globe. What's our business plan going forward? It has to be based on collaboration. What's the best example in the world of where we've really, really got deep, solid collaboration? Well, look at the EU. We've got all these national governments and then, you know, an international layer uh, that supports that. We share a big pot of common funds. We design rules together. We, we make certain aspects of foreign policy together. It's, it's like this is humanity collaborating at a higher level of collaboration 
than ever it did before. Yes, you've got things going on at the United Nations and, and so forth, but it's not really knit together as powerfully um, as it is in the EU. But, it, but all of that from World War II is going in the right direction. And, and science is also all about this. It's about the global team. So thinking about humanity in the long term, the, the direction that we really, really need to go in is how do we set the real collaborative frameworks within which you can have competition, but, but it's, those, it's those frameworks of collaboration to guarantee all of our health and wealth and peace and opportunities. That's what we really need to be forging. And I think science is a, is a beautiful and very clear example of how we can do that. And I think it's also a very a clear example of where Brexit has done damage. So um, I'm prepping at the moment a, a, a little dossier of, of Brexit damage um, done uh, for other talks and um, other engagements for myself and, and others. And looking through all the examples of, you know, damage to trade. Ah, yes, but what about COVID? Um, but what about, you know, other factors? And OK, so you then talk about individual businesses. And I mean, the, the clearest damage done as, as a little sort of microcosm where it's clearly down to Brexit, I think, is, is in the science. It's in the research and innovation. And it's the, in the collaborative programs that we used to be in that have broken and so we've seen uh, less money for it and we've seen less interest in our in our country for it and less talent come for it and less participations for it so um, I think science is a really good um, prism to show a the damage um, of something like Brexit but b the opportunities of when you do gather together to make those teams No, absolutely, completely agree with you. A um, couple of questions on the Northern Ireland Protocol um, now. So first from Peter, it seems to him that the Northern Ireland Protocol is insoluble on, on Boris Johnson's terms. Does Boris Johnson know that? Uh, does he know he's making promises that he can't deliver to the DUP in particular? Um, and secondly, if um, Boris Johnson were to go soon, how do these issues, um, would they get better or worse under a new PM? So not just the Northern Ireland Protocol, obviously, but the, the TCA and science in, in general. Um, could it get worse under someone else? Um, this is really fascinating right now in a grim way. Um, Boris Johnson, in order to shore up support from his hardliners, which has always been his go-to base, um, he, is, he is making threats about the Northern Ireland Protocol. I think this is putting the spooks on, on Rishi Sunak, who still fancies his chance in the long term and doesn't like the sounds that he would be hearing from the EU and from the US if they were to make such a move. But Boris Johnson is thinking about saving Boris Johnson. Um, nevertheless, because we've now had this vote against him, there are two new dynamics in play. One is that he's a lot more dangerous because people like that get dangerous when they're cornered and they get random because um, they, they, they're like a trapped rat and they have to jump out of that corner and do something dramatic and wild. Um, so he could go wild on it. But what is he going to be able to get through Parliament? Because now the rebels that are trying to take him down want to show that he is weaker. And I just read today that, that they've got their sights on the Northern Ireland Protocol as the thing to block. Now, why is the Northern Ireland Protocol the thing to block? Because a lot of people actually don't really care that much about Northern Ireland, but they do care about um pissing off america uh language uh um trade war with the eu um uh reneging on international uh contracts and damaging british science people do actually care about all that kind of stuff so they just want northern ireland to be settled for the most part um and they would rather that i think than boris johnson make 
some statement about integrity of, of the union for whatever reason and go to war with so many other um, uh, power players um, uh, around him and, and bring in so much um, damage at a, a, during a cost of living crisis. So um, it looks like that's what they are targeting. So what happens if that stalls? Well, if that keeps stalling, then the dynamic within Northern Ireland pretty much stays as, as it is, which is the trade links between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, the rest of Europe uh, grow and grow. And the, the trade links with the UK are sort of like stuck. Um, if they do blow up the protocol, then all hell breaks loose and that may satisfy the DUP, but it may upset a lot of other people in Northern Ireland because then you've now got a lot of damage being done there. If Boris Johnson goes, then who's going to come in and what's their policy going to be? Very hard to predict because will the majority of the Tory party then align with someone who is a very hard Brexiteer or more of a soft, pragmatic Brexiteer? It's hard to know. You'll, you'll have the Steve Baker faction, most likely, that want to go hard and be confrontational. But I don't know what they've got to gain from it. And if there's anyone who wants to be softer and more pragmatic about it, that would seem the sensible line, particularly if, if uh, the, you know, the appetite for aggressive Brexit isn't there within the wider public. Um, but then you've got some pretty nutty people within the Conservative Party that will kick up a fuss. So it's really, really difficult to predict. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's looking to me like if Boris Johnson and his government were confident about playing hardball on the Northern Ireland Protocol, they would have done it by now. Um, and that is a line, and that is something that I've also heard from Dominic Cummings previously, that um, he says that they've missed their window on it. Um, and you know, this is something that he was fully up for, breaking things all the way, but he thinks they've, you know, they're, they're too weak to do anything um, on it now, effectively, and, and it wouldn't go anywhere. So I think they're kicking the can down the road, looking for somewhere where they can bury that can. Um, and how they handle the DUP is going to be the trick. And Boris Johnson puts things off wherever he can, so he hasn't faced down the DUP yet. But um, I, I would hope that if any new person coming in, one of the first things they would do would be to face down the DUP and, um, yeah. But it's a mess. It's a real mess. Yeah. Um, so what do you think of Tobias Elwood's suggestion at the weekends of rejoining the single market? Um, how many problems would that realistically address? Oh, the details don't matter at this stage. The, the thing that matters is that he has single-handedly broken that, um, that vow of silence, that omerta within the Conservative Party and put it back on the table. And it's such an alarming concept, the Conservative Party, that uh, immediately and instinctively, many of them took the bait um, and jumped in on Twitter to attack him for those suggestions. So it's really let the cat out of the bag and there's now a topic of conversation. Um, I think it was also helpful that Daniel Hannan, who's usually not very helpful, decided to come out with, with a similar line. It's got people talking. And it's got people talking at a, at a, at a good time where they can see that the Northern Ireland Protocol is intractable and they can see that this would be a solution to it. And so you can sense that some people are looking for a new direction. So with Boris Johnson potentially, you know, limping on his, his way out, sort of uh, uh, lowing grumpily, then you can see a new course could be set. And I, and I know that scares some parts of the Conservative Party, but they might just have to do it because they've got the other fear that if they don't get themselves sorted on this in a really practical way and, and sort out aspects of the economy, then they're looking at Labour and the Lib Dems coming in and rewiring our democracy to be um, a 
more akin to a proportional representation one, which could lock them out for a generation. So um, politics, you know, when you step back from it, it can be fun, right? Because it, it, it's just crazy sometimes that the twists that gets into. So Tobias Elwood has done us a massive favor by actually making this a topic of conversation again. And the brilliant thing about it is that it has come from the Conservative Party. It would have been terrible if this had come from the Labour Party, because then suddenly we'd be going back into the same trenches as before, you know, Labour, Ramonas and the Tories, their proud Brexiteers and all of that. Whereas I'm, I'm very glad that Keir Starmer is not uh, gunning for the single market or gunning for a joining at this stage because um, that would force people back into the same sort of trenches as before. By staying off it, you can see lots of things happening, you know, under the radar in, in the polls about what people think of Brexit. And if it is Tories that start first championing the idea of rebuilding with Europe through single market, through customs union and saying, you know what, it's just important that we collaborate, then that's exactly the flavour that we need to encourage and gather around. I mean, my, my hope is that um, come election 2024, uh, one of the Tories elections lines is um, only the Conservatives can rebuild our relationship with Europe. Like, <laughs> uh, like it, it would drive me part nuts, you know, in disgust. But at the same time, if we get to that place, then we know for all the reasons that I told you before, that's a really good place to be in when it's, it's almost a competitive race to fix the UK by rebuilding solid relationships on our continent. So anything we can do to encourage that is a bit of a fast track to, to getting back to where we want to be. Um, a couple of um, linked questions here on a, on a slightly different topic. So um, English remains the oper operating language of Horizon Europe at the moment. Yeah. Um, have you detected any signs that the Commission will change this and make your, more use of, for example, German or French? I know the French have always been very keen for French to be the main language of the EU, but uh, they may not succeed in that. Uh, and secondly, is there an agenda of cutting down modern European language teaching in the UK? Uh -huh. um, so on the first one, no. Um, I mean, uh, the the language of science now um, globally is English. You know, it, it has been German previously, it has been Latin previously, but now it is English, English, English. And um, uh, a lot of the scientists uh, around Europe are excellent at English. Um, and so it's not the same issue that it was a few decades ago. I mean, I was, um, um, I brought up my, my two elder boys in Slovenia. And um, when uh, we were back here in the UK, um, my, my, my youngest son, he was, he was on the computer playing with his friends from Slovenia um, over, you know, shoot em up games. And, you know, they were talking a mix of English and Slovene. And then he, he wandered off and, and I sort of like wandered into his room. And his two friends from Slovenia were just busily chatting to each other in English. Um, you know, their, their world is um, online and global and, and that language is English. So that's not going back. The, the, the thing that France has always wanted, um, I think, is for French to be the diplomatic language, the, the, the formal language of sort of um, sophisticated diplomatic um, uh, 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 treaties, um, but you know that that's that's been their wish for a while. But that's that's got nothing to do with with science these days. Uh, English is the science language. As to the other question about whether um, our government is trying to uh, wind down other languages from the um, educational curriculum, I don't know. That's that's just not my window. No idea. Okay, fair enough. Um, I realise we're getting close to the end, so I've got a couple of slightly more fun questions for you. Uh, first of all, Sally has a bet with her friend that Boris Johnson will not stand at the next election. Do you think Sally will win her tenor? <laughs> Ooh. 
Um, secondly, have you ever considered spending for election yourself? Uh huh. So okay. Um, I think that I can't see Boris Johnson. Uh, well, I can see him leading um, the Conservatives into the next election, um, but that that takes a few dark twists to get there over the next couple of years in terms of ruthless behaviour within the Conservative Party and, and right wing press. I I think the likelihood is that he'll be he'll be gone by that stage, and and if he's not Prime Minister, then he won't want to be a backbencher. He'll he'll want to march off. He'll want to. Um, uh probably go out and uh you know uh, drink drinks with all of the big billionaires that have been backing him and they can slap him on the back and maybe he'll want to go on ample speaking tours making a lot of money for himself um cavorting or, or what have you so i think that if he goes as prime minister he's not going to do a theresa may and and stay on um he's going to do a, a sort of a David Cameron, you know, I'm out of here, I'm long gone. Um, so I think that it is a good bet. Um, I, I would I would support that bet. Yeah. Um, as, as for my own um, thoughts about politics, um, and if I ever want to stand for office, it, it, at the moment, no, because um, I don't know what party I'd do it with, um, because I believe more in movements of people and i like supporting and shepherding um movements of people i mean that's you know why i like european movement because it is doing now what i've thought it, it should have been you know i've thought for a long time it should have been doing um and it, it couldn't actually do during the people's vote campaign because it was starved of support and, and um, money at that time but being that hub that supports a lot of local groups um, in, in, a, in a good service sort of provision way. Similarly, that's why I've set up the, the bylines network, because I just thought we need local publications, um, but it's, it's a hard slog by yourself and people don't have the money for that. I will find a way to gather together a support hub so that we can um, set up our own regional publications and teams of people can run that and we can do citizen journalism and we can give everyone a voice so i think that there's much more than i that i can do in in all of the the, the, the social media and the um online newspapers world and online campaigning world than i could as an mp and if i were to be an mp what party would i pick you know, do you pick, you know, a smaller party where it's easier to get in? Or do you go with something like Labour where you are more likely to get into government, but you have to earn your stripes up all the way through the system? And um, I thought about um, that for the European elections 2019, throwing my hat into the ring for an MEP. But I quickly found out that the Labour system, um, you know, um, First, um, it, it, it was a list of those people who already were MEPs. Then after that, it was, you know, female, male, female, male. And from, you know, um, selected places, which meant that I, I really didn't have much of a shot throwing my hat in the ring there. So it's, it's a barriers to entry thing, um, as well as a satisfaction with what I'm doing at the moment thing and, and thinking that there's, uh, a lot of politics is not just about MEPs, a lot of politics is about us, and it's about communities and building those communities and building those structures, comm structures, campaigning structures, um, and, and all these kind of structures that nurture um, parts of society that we want to nurture, and, and, I, and I, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. I was in a call actually earlier today where um, a person on there was saying, that actually movements like ours are doing some of the jobs that political parties should be doing. So for example, calling out uh, the damage of Brexit and all these things like, like Ryzen and, and all of that, there is 
quite a lot of silence around Brexit coming from several of the opposition parties at the moment. And yeah. actually, it's really movements like ours and charities and other sort of democracy organisations that are the ones that are, that are screaming these messages that really some of the political parties should be doing. Yeah, sort of... and we, yes, we, we, we go out there, we cut the paths for them and we take flack for them. Mm. And then... <laughs> They come blasting through and take and all the they, they walk along, walk along, walk along. And, I mean, I, I, I remember in, in 2017 all, all the, the big tactical voting drive that happened against Theresa May. And then, um, and then, you know, Theresa May lost her majority. And, you know, amongst the, the Labour left, it was all awash with songs of, oh, Jeremy Corbyn. It's kind of like... Yeah, but you do realise the whole Remain community was tactically voting predominantly for Labour, but sometimes with Dems, for a different... That was never acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And in general election 2019, I, I, I spent a good 100k of funds that I I'd raised for Scientists for You and, and Healthier in the EU on northern marginal seats between Labour and Conservatives on issues of the NHS and trusting Boris with the NHS, which was later proven to be exactly his, his weak point that he uh, hadn't hit, you know, for what it's worth. And then after, after that, I thought, right, well, I've just, uh, I've just gained a whole load of money on what I think was, you know, beautifully designed stuff because it was using our Facebook page, um, uh, NHS for a People's Vote. Uh, that already had its fan base so pushing it to the right constituencies and then when they saw those messages come up on their facebook feeds and looked at the comments it already had the social proofing of all of our communities so i thought this is beautifully designed um but like who's who's grateful for that at the end of the day and and i mean i i feel particularly um with the labor party that they don't acknowledge fully, not just the socialist societies, but the other campaigning groups around them, like, for example, Emma, Make Votes Matter, that do a lot of the hard work, breaking new ground for them mm -hmm. with their CLPs, getting it through conferences, making all the movements for them so that they can go, hmm, when it's obvious you should go there, hmm, I've got an idea, we're going to go here. And <laughs> then they... <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and I just think there should be more acknowledgement by political parties of the ecosystems around them that prep the territory for them. I think um, the Conservative Party is generally better at that because they do have those tighter relationships with uh, the Telegraph and the Daily Mail and their Institute of Economic Affairs and Policy Exchange. You know, they work with them a lot more intimately because they recognise better their roles in, in paving paths for them. Um, but I think on the progressive end of things, you, you know, you've got politicians like Caroline Lucas or, or uh, Leila Moran who are fully aware of that and always fully involved and really part of that mix. But, but particularly with uh, the leadership, shall we say, of, of, the, of the Lib Dems and Labour, I don't think they really uh, clocked it yet or, or are appreciative enough yet of the importance of those satellite communities around them. It's not about the glory though, is it, Mike? <laughs> no, no. But yeah, it would be nice to have actually been at lunch, but anyway, that's a whole... But an occasional cheers, pal, might be nice. <laughs> you did a good job there, yeah. But, but uh, no. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Mike. It's been fascinating um, speaking to you. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all your questions. I'm hoping that I chose uh, enough of a, a spread of what was uh, covered to, to have a good uh, cover. So thank you very much, Mike. That was um, really interesting. And uh, for anyone who maybe came in late, we have recorded it and uh, we will be sharing it on our Bath for Europe YouTube channel. You can go there as well to see all the previous talks that we've done. We've had all sorts of uh, special guests in the past. So um, go and have a look uh, for that. And thanks for having me uh, virtually. Um, I've got a bunch of other virtual ones lined up. Feel free to jump in on those, yeah, even if it's um, not your, your part of um, uh, the country. Uh, and then also, I think at some future date, we just should have more 
uh, physical in, yeah. in real world events. Um, I think it's it's feeling like time that that can all kick off again. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's good for all of us on the community building front to actually, you know, sit in the pub together after these kind of um, uh, chats and discussions and exchanges and um, and uh, do it that way. Absolutely. Well, funny you should mention it, Mike. We actually have one happening this Sunday. Um, so really? we have, yes, yeah, so we have a picnic in the park this Sunday. Uh, the 12th of June starting at 3 p.m. So that's at Henrietta Park in Bath. Uh, so if you'd like to come and join us and meet us in real life, please do. We would love to, to see you all. And obviously we'll hopefully be planning some more events uh, throughout the, the summer as well, particularly as the weather is good. So we can hopefully have outdoor um, activities as well, which would be fantastic. Cool. Brilliant. Uh, well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, please check out our website for news. We also on Facebook and Twitter. It's all Bath for Europe, uh, bathforeurope.com for the website. Um, thanks again to Mike. Thanks to everyone for joining us. And uh, yes, keep an eye on our socials for future events. And please join us in the park on Sunday uh, if you're free. But, uh, thanks very much and have a very nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.